the definition session at the Color Lab convention in, where are we? Kansas City, Missouri. And this is the 7th of April, I believe. Yes, 7th of April. Uh, my name is uh, Barry Clasper, and um, I'm not sure what I am with reference to this session. Uh, when John and I met in the lobby uh, when we first got here, uh, he was under the impression that I was the moderator and he was the panelist, and I was under the impression that he was the moderator and I was the panelist. So um, I'm, I'm coming up with a new designation now called a panelator. And so we're dual panelators. I went Ooh, and asked Gail for a ribbon, and she just looked at me funny. So, um, Those of you who know what my voice normally sounds like may surmise that I have a cold, and uh, that's true. Those of you on this side of the room might want to reconsider your, your position. The speaker's right there, you know. Um, so that's why I've got my own mic so that I don't infect John here. Um, I'd never even attended one of these sessions uh, when Clark was doing them. So I listened to the one he did last year to try and get an impression of, of how they went. And since Clark is the, uh, the chair of the definitions committee, he had a, you know, a very authoritative uh, standpoint or perspective that he, could, that he could take on things. And the way he tended to go through the meeting was to give you some historical perspective on where the definitions came from, how the various committees interact uh, to create and approve definitions, um, and then he would sort of take things from the floor going through questions that people might have about various definitions. And if he didn't get questions from the floor, he thought some up himself. Um, I don't know that either John or I could bring that level of authority to, uh, to that kind of discussion. Um, but John has certainly been around long enough to be able to give you the historical perspective, so I'm going to ask him to, to do that. Um, I found that when I started thinking about this, realizing that I was going to be involved in this, that um, I didn't really understand in my own mind, at least in a way that I could articulate very well, how I use the definitions and kind of what role they play for me. So that led me down some lines of thought which I'll share with you, and then we can either debate that or go somewhere else. It's, it's up to you. It's kind of your session. So I'll turn it over to John at this point. So, so I, call and I just turned him off. Yeah, thank you. In 1979, people were already hard at work on the definitions for mainstream. It was an obvious follow-on to standardizing the mainstream list. Standardizing mainstream had the effect of making dance skills portable across the country, much the way 1575 basics did, but they had lost some of their power in the interim. Suddenly, there was less of a barrier for me coming from New England, where I was at the time, out to, to Oklahoma City to a national convention and knowing what to expect than there had been before that. Similarly, having a consistent meaning for what the calls were lowered barriers to people moving from place to place. How many people are familiar with the Lloyd Shaw and Do Paso story? Okay. Um, when Lloyd Shaw was first out traveling the country collecting calls, he discovered that dosido or dosido, they were used sometimes interchangeably, were not the same everywhere. Right? Some parts of the country it's what we know as dosido now. And in other parts it was this thing full of arm turns that had lots of energy in it. And the story has it that he, by fiat, renamed that one Do Paso, after the city of El Paso in Texas, just to have a standard naming for what the heck things meant. Well, this is sort of the same idea. You want to be able to know what to do when you go from place to place. <coughs> People started out working on the mainstream definitions, and it was obvious immediately that there were several masters. Some people, the technologists among us, wanted a really good understanding of what the calls meant. Some people wanted something simple that could remind them what the calls meant. Some people wanted words they could stand up and read to their dancers to teach the call. And if you've taught dancers, you know you're not going to get that for most calls. But there were people who wanted that. There were also people with 
political agendas about what square dancing ought to be like involved in the process. And the process of creating at least the mainstream and plus definitions was a balancing of all of these with the result that those first two sets of definitions in trying to serve many masters never served anyone well. Um, how many people realize that there is a column somewhere in Spin Chain and Exchange the Gears? <laughs> yeah, one guy, yeah. Okay, that's a result of the political move because the common description of exchanging the stars, oh, well, that uses challenge terminology, and we can't do that. Okay, so somebody came up with a way of describing that it ended in a column, and then somebody faces right and somebody faces left, which got the correct ending position, but gets roll completely wrong. It gets, you know, just, it's a mess. It's still in there. Um, the advanced and challenge definitions were done mainly by advanced and challenge callers, and therefore mostly from the let's get it technically complete as best we can point of view. But we were left with a mainstream and a plus document that served yeah, nobody well. Clark, for the last umpteen years, has been embarked on revising the mainstream definitions. And I'm here to tell you, those masters are still around. So getting anything done, it just takes a very long time. About a quarter of the calls have new definitions at this point. Um, I think they're clearer. I worked in the publishing industry for K-12 to education, and they are very good about tracking how hard things are to read because, you know, you want a fifth-grade textbook, it's got to be readable by fifth graders. Um, I ran some of the standard readability measures over the old definitions, and somewhere between 11th and 12th grade you can understand them. And I ran them over at least the newer parts of the mainstream definitions, and it's more like 8th or ninth grade, which ain't great, but it's a lot better. On the other hand, they look more complicated because they cover more. They say more. The definitions are longer because there are more parts to what he says. He gives you some examples of what you'll hear. And they've included the styling and the timing, which makes things look four times as long as they used to look. So they look daunting. In fact, I find them easier to read. And that brings us to where we are now. So as as I as I said when uh, when I started thinking about this this session, um, and what the definitions meant to me, I found I was surprised because um, when I when I go and look at the actual definitions of a lot of calls, I, I find that. I'm, I'm a little surprised by what I read there. That's not quite what I expected. And I thought, how can this be? I mean, I do a lot of calling. I call um, all the levels, and I do a lot of work in the, in the advanced and challenge arenas where the actual crisp definition of a call is something you expect the dancers to know, and the dancers certainly expect you to know. I thought, how can it be that I don't know verbatim, you know, the definitions of all these calls, and yet I seem to be able to function um, and I realized that it's because the definitions that we all use um, are not the ones that are written in the book. They may be loosely derived from the ones that are written in the book, but in fact, the definitions that we are all using, the mental models of the calls that we have in our minds, are an amalgam of the original definition, what we've been taught, and what we've experienced over the years as, as we've danced that call. And in fact, I think if you could, you know, somehow look into the brain of the average mainstream or plus dancer and look at the mental model they have for a lot of calls, it's probably far more restricted than the actual definition of that call is because they may have been taught how the call worked when they, were, when they first um, were taught. But then over time, as they experience the call, they get it from one or two standard applications. And after a while in their mind you get this feeling that, well, you can't do follow your navel with the girls going in. You can't do that from here. Uh, you can't do a zoom from a completed double pass through. You, you know, you can't do that from here. And that's a function of 
the fact that the mental model that the dancers have built up from their experience has been modified um, as they've as they've danced, and uh, so I realize that the the place of the definitions in our community is not what you might think it is. Uh, some people look at the written definition and they think this is the law. I mean, how many times have you uh, heard a dancer go up to a caller at a dance and say? You can't do that. That's not on the list, you know, and, and berate him for, for doing something which the whole floor got, and everybody knew what he wanted, but you can't do that. It's not on the list. Um, so we have this – you've met him, have you? <laughs> so in some case, we have this kind of jailhouse lawyer um, attitude to it that, you know, if, if you transgress something that a comma implies should happen, that, you know, you're a bad guy. Um, on the other hand – we sometimes see callers take a call and they look at the definition the way it's written and they say, well, if that's what it says, you should be able to do this. And they do some absolutely awful, grotty thing to the dancers, uh, expecting the, that, that they should be able to do that because that's the definition. And both those cases, of course, are wrong. So... As I thought about this, and this is what I'd kind of like to throw out for, for further discussion, and uh, John probably has thoughts on this, this idea too, is that the way we use the definitions is as kind of a governor on our folk art. Square dancing is a folk art. What we do is not what's in the definitions. What we do is what's out there on the dance floor. What the dancers are dancing, what we're calling... The amalgam of all that, that's our folk art. And what we're attempting to do with the definitions is capture the state of the folk art and record it so that we can communicate with people exactly what that state is. But because it's a folk art, it's continually evolving, it's continually changing. And as John said, in the, in the early days, in the situation that precipitated us having these definitions and lists, was that things were spinning out of control. You couldn't go from one part of the country to another part of the country and, and dance and expect that the dancers were going to react in the same way to the same call. Um, the situation we have now, when you think about it, is you can go anywhere in the world and dance the same way. I've gone to Japan, and I've danced in Japan, and they dance the same way that we do here. Almost. All, all, almost, yeah. <laughs> all over Europe, um, it's, you know, the definitions have really realize this dream for us that you can travel anywhere and if they say they're calling the plus program or the advanced program you know what to expect as a dancer and as a caller you know that if the floor thinks they're dancing advanced um, there are certain things you can expect sometimes <laughs> sometimes they don't meet your expectations but but the fact is this the fact is we've realized this dream because of these these definitions but at the same time since the definitions were first recorded, some things have evolved and some things have changed. And so while the, I think it's going to be necessarily the case that definition, the definitions as written will always be in some way a little out of sync or a little out of phase with reality because reality is always changing. The definitions have been written in some, you know, it's some static period of time. The, the effect of that is is this effect that I talked about as being a governor on what's going on. It kind of puts a break on change that's too rapid and which would break our activity apart into a lot of niches. Um, but at the same time, it allows change to happen in a controlled way because we do see that when a consensus seems to have developed in, in the way that we as a community do this folk art thing, that it does work its way back into the definitions, and it becomes recorded as this is the way we do it. Um, so that that's sort of the perspective I have now on the way we use these these definitions. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing other people's opinions on it, and uh, we'll start with John's. <laughs> so I come at it from a slightly different point of view. Um, I like to think out of it as the difference between common law and statute law. Common law was something that was sort of discovered by the judges. There wasn't something written down that said you will do it this way or that way. 
the judge sort of scratched his head, looked at what went on, and said, this makes the most sense here. If you go back and look at the sets in order five-year books from the 50s, you discover that you recognize the call names, and about a third of the time you won't quite recognize how it's being used. But if you squint your eyes a little bit and just say, okay, I'll go with the flow, suddenly you can, you can track what, what the author who has written this thing down wanted, and you're more or less okay. In attempting to standardize things, you write stuff down. As soon as it's been written down, there will be somebody who will come along and start to play language lawyer with it and say, okay, you wrote it this way. You know, somewhere somebody said all eight circulate centers stay centers. So we'll set up uh, you know, two-phase lines and have the centers half circulate. This is now an hourglass where you've got a diamond in the middle and a box on the outside. And I can call all eight circulate from here because the diamond being the centers can circulate its spot and the outsides can circulate around the outside. And nobody except this one guy in Northern California believes this. But you get that kind of interpreting going on. So the whole, the whole pattern is different. Another way of looking at it is the difference between description of what's going on and prescription about what we want to have happen. Some amount of what's in these definitions and I know because I helped write some of them, is I want it to work this way. Okay, I've seen seven different ways done across the country. I see you, and I'll, I'll stop in a second. I want it to work this way. We'll write the words this way, and away you go. Now would be a good time to... We're headed, we have a mic headed your way. Uh, Bob Rollins, uh, Broken Arrow. It seems that we get focused on one specific move, and we should be focused on a on a flow of action. And that uh, if you have a rule like the right shoulder passing rule, mm -hmm. it really should apply throughout, at least throughout the mainstream floor. And it's for some reason, when it gets to the plus floor, they come up with movements like ping pong circulate, and it's oh no, you pass left shoulders here, and that's wrong. They ought to be able to come up with something where it's if you've got a right shoulder passing rule, it should be a right shoulder passing rule. Oh. Look at cross trail through. It's gone now, but I mean, that was another example. It's still there in the form of half sachet. Um, from left-hand ocean waves, if I call all eight circulate, that outside dancer who's coming around the outside and the center dancer, what shoulder do they pass? What shoulder would you expect them to pass? Okay. Well, I, but I, oh, I didn't say I didn't say left. I just set up a left hand wave and said circulate. But what you've already set it up with left, and and at that point you've already defined the left. Uh -huh. But the right shoulder passing rule says when two dancers are going to come and collide, they pass right shoulders. Right. And you call it ping pong circulate on that. Out when you get to the outside, unless that guy knows enough to slide over and turn around. Uh, he's going to crash into somebody. It should be right, right shoulder passing rule. If he's following the path that's specified, there's no crash. But it's an illegal path. No. I think it's an illegal path. Uh, you want, you're speaking, Personal opinion. You're speaking of from a left-hand wave in the center? Or what? No, standard ocean wave in the center. Uh, okay, who's passing left shoulders? I'm not seeing it. The, the, uh, the left-hand dancer going forward to the end. You know, I used to teach it that you would you would extend and that couple is facing out does a partner trade, but that's not right. I'm told yep. the person on the left actually goes in and passes left shoulders because that other guy comes around and takes the. Uh, they both wind up facing in, and in order to do that, they pass left shoulders. Yeah. I mean, can we get a square up and take a look? Yeah, would you? That'd be cool. Just uh, shift those tables over near the wall. They don't need to be there. I think we've got lots of you room. You can dance on the tables. You can dance on the That'd tables. That'd be fun. <laughs> no, there won't be any round dancing here. But, but we're just checking with a fishtail. Uh, let's have these sides past the ocean just for a second. Okay. Um, so you're, ta you're talking about this guy here? No, sir. I'm the ocean. Okay. The... I apologize. Now, this is what I was showed at one of the other meetings, and I, I couldn't understand okay. it. That this fellow here, 
who had to come forward, wound up over here. Yeah. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it by coming around. But he came, he did it by coming through here Ooh. and then turning around Ooh. like that. And I Ooh. said, Yeah. Say what? Well, yeah, we agree with you. He comes around. That's what I meant. Yeah. And, yeah. and and it, it really bothered me because it was well, a circulate. Yeah. 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 So if you had from a left hand yeah. wave, okay. they will certainly okay. do what feels like passing left shoulders. And we'll get. Yeah. Phew. No, no, Thank no. you. <laughs> I think that solved that real fast. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. What's upright, Doc? So the meeting's been worthwhile already. Yeah. <laughs> well, right shoulder passing rule is good. Right shoulder passing rule is perfectly yeah. good, except on, except where it's not. Except where it's not. <laughs> um, the, which the, is basically on variants of half sachet. The, yeah, the confusion, I think, is that, that the right shoulder passing rule applies to two people who are approaching the same position from opposite directions. The crossing rule tends to be invoked when you've got people who are moving sideways towards one another as they do in a half sachet or as they do in some crossover movements. Um, and so the rule there was that the bell side went in front, which created, in effect, a left shoulder pass. So it's it's really based on two different actions associated with the call. Now, the reality is, I mean, here's another good point. If you go out on the average dance floor and you call a move that involves doing one of these crossover actions, the dancers will pass right shoulders almost universally. Um, I've only noticed that even on some even on some C4 floors, they will not pass the, quote, correct shoulder. Uh, it's only when you get the real purists that you'll find people using the, yeah, there's one right there, <laughs> that you get people using the correct passing shoulder. And 99% of the time, it doesn't really matter until, you know, some really sadistic Crash caller has foot. has a half move or something that leaves you in that, in that formation. But that's kind of the historical reason why we have these two different thoughts about whether you pass a right shoulder or a left shoulder. Phew. <laughs> Brad has a question. Brett Kaffeman, Renton, Washington. Can you give an example of that? For instance, say we have a line of four facing out, centers cross run. Just maybe so people could kind of see. I'm, I'm assuming everybody understands what you're saying, but it may be good sure. to actually see it. Yeah. Yeah. So, are John? Are you going to talk, or am I going to talk? Okay. So let's assume that these people are the uh, are in a line looking out. In other words, there's people behind them with their backs to them. Now, if the call is centers cross run, if you visualize where the the centers would go with that, um, they're going to have to pass by one another, and the ends are just going to slide in directly sideways. So the centers are the ones that have the issue, right? They're both trying to get to the same place on the same path. The, there are some people that will argue in this case that um, it effectively becomes like a partner trade and, and you, you would pass right shoulders in that case. And, in fact, that's, I think, what 99% of the people are going to do. There's other people that argue that because you're starting facing in the same direction, it has this, this sideways action that we were talking about, which means you should use the bell goes in front rule. So... Let's just call it and see what happens. Center's cross run. That's what you'll see on 99.9% .9 of the floors, I think. You did it left shoulder? And I didn't even notice. And I didn't even notice, right? I mean, you will often see some, you know, bobbling as, as people meet. Question back there? Give them a mic. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah when, when I've – I'm sorry, I'm uh, Ken Britt in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, when I was going through an A1 class with, you know, one of our callers, Montgomery, uh, we, we got into some things like this, and, and the way he described it to us was that when you're doing a cross run, you are going to basically bump in like face-to-face -face with the person that's right next to you if you're centered in, in this yep. particular case. And because you're doing that, because, because it's a change of direction, you are – 
going to turn when you do this. And so when you first turn, you are going to do a face-to-face with the person right next to you, and you are going to do the right shoulder passing rule for that purpose. That, 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 that yeah. was how it was explained to me. And I think there's a very logical oh, argument. But actually, if we just there. go back to the line for a second, John. Yeah. If we assume that this is a line facing out, right, and these two P, Francois, don't turn me off, John. Um, if instead of calling centers cross run, we called centers circulate, go ahead and do that. Just imagine what you do in a circulate. See, they just do a trade and they pass right shoulders. Why do they do that? Because the circulate path has both people working along exactly the same track in opposite directions. So they just instinctively pass right shoulders. So the nub of this argument is that people doing a cross run are, in effect, starting like they were doing a circulate, except they're just going to extend it past the far end. They actually crash to the same position coming from opposite directions, so the right shoulder rule applies. Other people say, no, that's not true. Actually, what they're doing is they're both kind of stepping forward and crossing as if they would in a sachet, and that's why the left shoulder rule applies. Now, contrast what Brett and I did as center's cross run. Let's have the ends cross run. Notice the ends are headed, interesting, way more toward each other. I'd have passed right shoulders there. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're much group. more like <laughs> coming at each other head on. Uh, there's another problem here. You're talking bell and bow, and to me, as soon as you say bell and bow, you're out of the main, a plus, mainstream plus. You're, you're going, when We're, you use okay. bell bow concepts, that's where it belongs up there. It doesn't belong on a mainstream plus floor. When you're talking plus, that line facing out, I could say crossfire, and I would still expect the centers to trade and pass right shoulder to right shoulder. Sure. If I said centers trade, I'd expect them to pass right shoulder to right sure. shoulder. If I said centers run sure. or cross run, it would be different. Run would go to the left uh, for, for the guy on the left and right to for the guy on the right. But if it was cross run, they would have to pass right shoulder to right shoulder because that's a plus we're using bell and bow just to identify people, yeah. not, and, but and for no I, other I understand purpose. that, but, but bell and bow concept is, is, is above the plus floor. Sure. See, and this, this is an example of the kind of thing that I was talking about. In fact, the bell and bow concept exists in party nights. I mean, if you, as soon as you say the man's standing on the left and the lady's standing on the right, you've invoked bell and bow concept. We didn't call it that, but that's all it is. It's just nomenclature. And at some point in their wisdom, they decided, well, they're going to put the bell and bow concept on the advanced list. So Why it needs to be there, I don't know. So now all the lists below that are relegated to saying the dancer on the left and the dancer on the right, which takes a lot longer to say, um, instead of being able to use this codified version of bell and bow, which means exactly the same thing. Same thing with leaders and trailers, which have just recently been voted onto mainstream. mainstream. I mean... The concept of leaders and trailers, again, exists at all levels. You know, you can't do a Zoom without knowing what a leader and a trailer is. But the fact is, by having leaders and trailers up on some higher list, the general conclusion of a lot of people is, I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to think about that. But uh, the fact is that we use these concepts. Don't, you know, you have to understand the distinction between the actual concept, the mental model, and the word that's being used to invoke it. Um, so for our purposes in here, we'll use bell and bow because it's a nice, succinct code that explains to people what it is we're talking about. But I wouldn't use it on a mainstream floor. No. I, if you said bell on a mainstream floor, bell and bow, meaning you expect mm-hmm. them to actually do something, you know that that's not going to happen because the dancers have not been trained that way. Not particularly, no. No. And it's, it's really just a word in this case. Maybe if we go back, Brett Kaffman, Brett Kaffman, Renton, Washington, maybe if we go back to cross, where that came from, maybe that will. Okay. I, I know that opens up another can of worms, but it might help understand. So we're, we're rebuilding the definition of cross run from earlier history here. Um, the real core call was cross trail through, where the lady was allowed to go in front, matter of courtesy. Right. As soon as you got that crossing action, people started to say, well, any time you get that kind of crossing action, person on the right should go in front. And normally it was a lady, but as time went on, that, that changed. And so from here, centers, and this is my view, other people disagree with me, right? Early in the cross run, they are so close to facing the same direction that 
you can't say they're coming at each other nose to nose to pass right shoulders. I would treat it as though it were almost a cross trail through. Senders cross run. On the other hand, humor me and do it my way this time. Let's have the ends cross run. Notice they are coming at each other almost nose to nose by the time they get there. And that's why I would pass right shoulders there. But that's me. Um, I would not call choreography that depended on this. And that, you know, that leads us to the question of what kind of, of, uh, of emphasis do we put on the absolute written word? Yourself. The absolute written word definition um, that we find in the definitions book. Because we know that there are calls out there that have uh, varying levels of consensus. Um, there are people that absolutely disagree with the written definition in some cases. Um, and uh, our, our reaction, at least my reaction is, like I have a number of calls that I really don't like the written definition. For instance, just to pick an old bugaboo, Crossfire. Yeah. There's those of us who believe that Crossfire is a four-person call. And there's no way in the world that lines facing out Crossfire gives you a, th a quarter tag set up. You lost Just, that fight. I lost Live that fight. It. So the result of that now is that I, as a caller, never call that. Or if I do, I always follow it up with a call where it doesn't matter where the center's wound up. Swing through, for example. Yes. So that's sort of my reaction as a caller. But there's still a lot of dancers out there. Something we need to remember when we monkey with the definitions. Do we need these guys standing in front of us anymore? Uh, we, no, thank uh, you. Th please, Sorry. thank you. Sit down. No, you know, I'd they're standing talk there down, so patiently. <laughs> yeah. When we monkey with the definitions, um, what we're doing is we're we're changing the foundation that a lot of dancers have built their mental model on. Their mental mental model has been modified over the years by all the experience they've had, but. The original way they were taught um, is still kind of the, the foundation of that. And so a lot of people, I one, as one of them, were taught that crossfire is a four-person call. Now, the person that taught me crossfire never, ever did it from lines facing out, I don't think, although he was the type of caller that showed us everything from everywhere. Uh, so he didn't think of that. But the first time I heard the call, I thought about, how he taught me, it's a four-person call. That means that I don't play with the people on the other side of the square at all. You know, I have to do it in my own group of four. And that gave me my answer. Um, when we then, that was not the answer for everybody, right? So we went through some thrashing and chaos and whatnot, and we came up with a definition which actually the way it's written doesn't explicitly say you get a quarter tag, but it kind of encourages that to be the result. <laughs> it was a really interesting choice of words. So now we've got a group of dancers out there who, whose mental model says it's a four-person call, I would never end in a quarter tag, and another group of dancers that have been taught since that that say, well, yeah, of course you get a quarter tag. That's obvious. You as a caller have to be aware that you've got those two populations on the floor and that if you choose to use that choreography, that you have to somehow manage the two different perceptions that you know are going to be out there. And that's true for for a number of calls where we've evolved it over the years and things have changed. If we look at the challenge program, uh, Scoot and Little and Scoot and Plenty vacillated back and forth a couple of times as to whether after the Scoot back, do the people on the outside always quarter right or do they quarter to the handhold? If you, even if you don't know what the call is, you can kind of understand what the issue is. Um, and there was a debate about that. And we actually changed the definition, what, three times? I think we changed it to be always right, and then we changed it back again to be the handhold, and right now it's the handhold. Um, but the, def yeah, the definition was, was actually changed, and now we have this continuing debate. This all happened, what, 15, 20 years ago. We Longer still have the question in a lot of people's minds as to what the outsides do after they've done the scoot back because we monkeyed with the definitions and we vacillated back and forth. So we have to recognize that you know, whenever we do change something, that we're we're playing with the mental models of a huge population out there, uh, who have who have either learned it long ago, and their mental model is now something that's somewhat separated from the written definition. Um, and there's other people that have just learned it recently, and they're going to take it almost verbatim from the written definition. So, could we just, for amusement value, 
get four people back up and make a line of four. Okay, John's got the definition of run I've and got cross the, run here. I've got the cross run definition in front of me, and I want you to do it the way it's written here. Okay. It says, so I'm going to have the centers cross run. When the active dancers, that will be the centers, are both facing the same direction, which you are, you move forward in a semicircle, passing each other. So do that much. I didn't say anything about running around the end dancer yet. So you've walked forward in a semicircle and passed each other, and you're now facing me. <laughs> right? And you're now in the center of the line. And now you can run on the run into the vacated spot on the far side. Ah, uh, the far side. I'm reading the words out of the definition. <laughs> uh, well, I, yes, I'm imposing some interpretation on them, but I claim that my interpretation, given just those words, was reasonable. Beg pardon? There's no while. Each of the, let's see, if the inactive dancers are center, they sidestep to become ends. If the ends, they sidestep to become centers, which is fine. It so doesn't say. Oh, oh sorry. It, it is turned it. on. Sorry, we have to. We'll, we'll run the volume up here. Oh, oh, there you go. So the, the centers do something independent of the ends. And then when they decide to do it, the ends do something. That's not the way it is. They're all moving at the same time, right? This doesn't say that. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. A cross run, starting formation, line, two-face line, or waves. Each of the two directed at active dancers, who must both be centers or ends, run into the spot vacated by the farthest inactive dancer. Well, there you go. This is, ah, this is cross run. Yeah, cross we're, run. We say that topics. again. Say that again. The vacated inactive Spot dancer. Farthest inactive dancer. Okay, which, so basically. Which gets us the normal, it gets us what you would expect. So your interpretation is not right, not correct because. Sure. If, if these two are active right here in the center, his furthest inactive dancer is right over here. I, I completely agree Same with here. you. So as soon as he moves, he doesn't go I, into the I center. He moves and then he waits for him to vacate. Once he vacates, then he can take his place because that's what it says. He goes to the furthest dancer and takes his position. Okay, but it says here when the active dancers are both facing the same direction, they move forward in a semicircle and pass each other. So go ahead and do that. All right, the semicircle gets you. But don't, now, okay, so you're going to do that? Go ahead. Fine. That's and just then, because you then, know what the call really and is. And then, you... having done that, you run into the vacated spot on the far side. Yeah, see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. this is cross run. <laughs> like a semi a semicircle is is 180 degrees, right? A semicircle yeah. is half of a circle. So right. So the way it's written, if you just read the words and and that's all you know about the definition, right? It, it's not going to look much like a cross run the way we understand it. Yeah. So this is, I'm not I'm not doing this because I believe the result. <laughs> Yes, they, you would expect so. Yes, but, yeah, I, yes. I'm, I'm doing this not because I believe what I'm saying, okay? Yeah. I'm the, doing this because I can read the definition that way. Right. The point this is that, the, we're, that John is making here is that what's written in the definition is not what we practice. If somebody were to read this and know nothing else and try to execute cross-run, they would not be successful. Uh -huh. And that is what's happening in Russia and China and all the other places where somebody takes this document and translates it into the local language. These definitions are not, that's, an, that's the old definition, it has not been revised, are not strong enough to stand up against that. And that's why in some parts of Europe you can get a thar and the caller will call scoot back. And he means slip the clutch, swing half, and slip the clutch and go back to the original person. Because you can read it that way. <laughs> yeah. Frightening, ain't it? And that's one of the driving reasons behind the format of the new definitions that Clark is putting together, is to, is to try and remove some of that ambiguity that's created yeah. just by the English language. And the fact that a lot of the older definitions were you know, written by 
by guys who are who are trying to capture the essence of this folk art thing that we're talking about in as few words as in possible. as few words as possible. Uh, most of them probably were not professional wordsmiths in the sense that they were used to writing technical language that captured uh, physical reality. Yep. So there's going to be lots of gaps and like this where seemed like a logical idea when they wrote it down, but you know when you actually read the words and stand back and try and interpret the words. Uh, on the basis of what they actually say, as opposed to what we know they're supposed to mean, <laughs> um, that you get into these these funny situations. So we've got Trevor first, and then we'll come back to him. Trevor Day. Uh, are we on? Yes. yes. Trevor Day, Manchester, England. This is one of the um, big problems that we have on there when it goes away from people whose first language is English stroke American. And, and I first came across it when um, we danced with some people on there who had not learnt in a traditional club on there. They'd learnt from the definitions. And the one that surprised me on there was rolled away with a half sachet. And they ended up back where they started because they did the roll away and then they did the half sachet. Uh-huh. Okay. Perfectly logical. Perfectly logical when you translate it into their own language on there because they heard the two distinct parts that you were asking <laughs> them to do. Frightening. Uh, Ken Britton, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, some years ago, uh, I had learned about uh, a computer based learning aid for square dancing. I forgot what the name of it is. I bought it online. You probably all know about it, but you can basically watch, you know, from, you know, looking straight down, you know, the, the animated dancers mm-hmm. do the calls from a variety of starting positions. And I'm thinking, well, in this age that we have today of computers, why don't we make our definitions in that format that include a visual representation of what's being done rather than depend on words alone. I'm sorry, that would make sense. That's against the rules. <laughs> and uh, Pam Clasper, Toronto, are you volunteering to help? Because that would be an enormous task. It would be exceedingly useful, but an enormous task. There, yeah, there are well, actually is a website out there called Tanimations, I think, Tanimations. where they've done some of that. I don't know, know exactly how many of the calls they've done it for, and... Uh, but I know that there there is some work like that, but it and is that's that's an interesting idea that maybe we should pass on to Clark. Um, why couldn't our quote official definitions include pointers to um, web resources that allowed people to actually see the calls being executed? Because that the Taminations was done by a dancer in Japan, I believe, not it, it was, through yeah. any formal anything. It was just oh yeah, a started out as a dancer in Japan. It's now a guy at Tam Twirlers up north of San yeah. Francisco. Yeah, the, the Stanford Quad site has some of that. Are they using the Tanimation technology yeah. or something They'll different? Just point you to Tanimations. It got quiet suddenly. Yeah, and I just got to thinking here. Bob Rollins again. Dangerous. Uh, when you come up with some one of these definitions and you write it down, mm-hmm. go to the fourth or fifth grade and get four kids that have never done any of this before. Tell them what you want and see if they can do it. Uh-huh. And if they can do it, then, then you've got a good write-up. I like that idea. Do we have other questions? We still have some time. Do we have questions about particular definitions? Because if you care? don't, I do. <laughs> cool. All righty. Oh, okay. Brett has a question. Here he comes again. Brett Kaffeman, Renton, Washington. Um, linear cycle is one that I believe I'm doing it correctly with an inverted line or an outverted line, but I want to confirm that i am got the right flow. So if we actually think we probably actually need at least four, it might look more interesting with eight. Okay, so 
Now, I'm not sure I caught what you were talking about. He wants linear cycle from an inverted line. Linear cycle from, okay. Okay, uh, head step into the center face your corner. Put centers in. Now, is it this kind of inverted line you wanted or the other way around? Either one. Okay. So the question is, if you've got a setup like this, linear cycle, that's just, here's my mental model of, of linear cycle because I couldn't recite the definition verbatim, although I can get it on my computer fast enough if I have to. It starts with a hinge. Everybody do that. The outlookers fold behind the inlookers, and you do a, a pass-through using the same shoulder that your handedness indicated, which in this case is going to be involved crashing, so people in effect are going to do it passing right shoulders. And then you're going to peel in the direction that you originally hinged, so some will peel left and some will peel right. That would be my interpretation of doing linear action from inverted lines, or linear cycle, rather. Can you say that again over the mic? It just seems more flowing. The dancers feel more comfortable with that double pass through and peeling to the right, both of them. I, I understand right. what you're saying, but as soon as you made that first single hinge with was a right turn, motion to the right, fold, fold to the right, double pass through, peel to the right. But don't forget, for half the dancers, it was a fold to the left. And... Because of the crashing rule, they wound up passing right shoulders, which you're what absolutely he, just just saying. Yeah. Ab you're absolutely right that the dance feel, everybody peeling to the right, it would be much preferable. But that's not what the rule of the call says. And in fact, if you were to add a roll onto it or something, then the direction you peeled would make a difference. So it becomes important. Was it a right-handed ocean wave they started from, or a left-handed? It was ocean an wave? inverted line. It was, it was an, an inverted, inverted line. line. So the, you're right. So, but they had right hands joined, right? Some had left, uh, some had right. Okay, sorry, I missed that. I'm all you did a left hand, all the, inlooker, the outlooker fold. <laughs> Don't do it from inverted line weights then. Wade Driver, uh, obviously I've been doing this thing and I may have to go and look at because I do it right hand, left hand. I've never done it inverted, but I've always had them peel toward the shoulder that they pass on the pass-through because if you peel the other way, you're going to a position that doesn't exist. That's my only problem. Yes. Uh, All here's right. A, here's, a mic. So, here's your mic. <laughs> let's see. Let's have the centers do a U-turn back. Okay. And let's run this by pieces just for a second. Okay. Everybody hinges. The outfacers fold behind the centers. We do the double pass through. And now, and now you would have us peel off to the right, yes? Okay. He and I peel off to the right. We're over here. They peel off to the right. They're over there. Thank you very much. You're not facing us. <laughs> okay. And we're standing here hanging off the edge. We have four people facing in the center and four people hanging off the edge. Exactly. No one. Well, I think standard linear cycle puts you in that same position. I but I pardon? think part of the, quote, gestalt of the linear cycle call is that it turns back into, in effect, a box of four with the people that you were working with. Yeah, that's right. You don't take an offset because of the peel. That's I would. You would. Yeah. Because well, here's another interesting disagreement on, because the, on the written definition. Let's, let's, let, let, let's go back to squared set for a minute. What does the definition say after the double pass through? I'll show you. Let's have the... Let me yeah, get the definition you? out. Thank you. Let's have the... Yeah. Let's have the head step into the center, turn to face your corner, step to a wave. Okay. Step one, you hinge. Step two, the outfacers fold and you walk straight forward. Go ahead and do that. Outfacer folds behind him, walk straight forward all the way through, notice that there is some, all the way through, notice there is some space there to your right, peel off to the right, they fill that space. That is, is that's how it's said in the definition? Yes. 
It says walk straight forward and then everybody peels to the right? No. Well, well I want the right definition. Anyway. That was the right. Stop doing that to me. Okay. It's, okay. All dancers will then move forward in a double pass-through action. Part three. Part three. If the hinge is right-handed, peel right. If the hinge is left-handed, peel left and is facing couples. Yeah, so it explicitly says end as facing couples. So to me, that means that, that regardless me of which direction you peel, you're going to make an adjustment and breathe to become facing couples. Thank you. Another one beaten down. Does that, <laughs> does that answer your question, Brad? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you, out of an inverted line, if you called linear cycle and roll, you would have people rolling in opposite directions. Yeah. All right, question, all right? Because uh, very obviously I, I was misunderstanding the, the definition. How do you go about, how difficult it is to get a definition changed? Because, <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm not being facetious, I'm being there's, serious. If, there's if, a if committee you, meeting at. <laughs> yeah, if you have a suggestion for how things should change, Get it to Clark Baker. Okay. And I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm serious no, because I'm, I've always understood it. It's whichever shoulder you pass as you double pass through, that's the way that you peel. You know, now that yeah. I, I'll be honest with you, I should have read it in more detail. Because if the hinge is the way it goes, it has to be that way. You have no option. I just don't happen to like it. You know? Uh, yeah. And I, that's certainly a reasonable position. Okay, right. Yeah, Clark, Clark, very carefully, if you have suggestions for how things ought to change. Yeah. If a suggestion comes in, he effectively stamps it with a number and tracks it Good all deal. the way through. You know, people talk about it, and they may accept it. They may modify it. They may say, you know, we think yeah. you're full of beans. But that, at least it will get considered. That, that's part of the – remember the – you shut me off again. We keep doing that to one another. The governor analogy I use where, you know, the definitions process that we're using is acting as kind of a control on – wild proliferation of variations on, on calls. That mechanism is if you think that something doesn't make sense or it could be done better with a, you know, a different perspective on it, send those, those comments to Clark. He's the, the catchment point for that. Um, and there is a mechanism within the committees to have you know, all the suggestions reviewed and considered. And if it seems that that's the new consensus, you know, if the result of that kind of observation is that it seems that we really do have a new consensus on how it should work. Maybe it really should be the passing shoulder that matters instead of the the hinging action that matters. Um, if enough people believe that, it changes. So we got another question down uh, here. Yes, sir. My uh, primary uh, calling is on a mainstream floor. Okay. And so my thinking is mainstream a lot. And when I'm teaching... Uh, I'm always asking them, what kind of ocean wave do you have? And they'll answer me left-handed or right-handed. Well, why? And they will say, because end and adjacent dancer are holding right hands. And I tell them that if that's the case, the caller is going to make you, the end dancer, go forward or forward to the right. And it's part of a teaching tool as I go along. Now, I'm talking mainstream thinking here. If, you're, if you get up into the plus field and you start talking linear cycle, that hinge, fold, follow, peel deal works perfect. If you're in a left-handed ocean wave, the motion's to the left. If you're in a right-hand motion, ocean wave, the motion's to the right. And and I don't see any problem with any of that. Uh, Pam Clasper, if I can chime in. I don't see a problem with any of that either. This was, I would think, what would be considered under extended applications, where we had the inverted. So some of them were in a left-hand wave and some of them were in a right-hand wave. And that's yeah. where we came up with, yeah, very extended, as Barry says. I, I would I would hesitate to use that on a high challenge floor if I actually expected the dancers to r realize the implications of of which way they were going to like adding a roll on it I wouldn't think about doing that before C3 maybe check on yeah <laughs> uh, Brett Kapman, Renton Washington another one of the reasons that I showed that example is because we've all called you know left couple do your part of a wheel and deal right couple recycle or something like that so there are there are similar moves to that, and and I guess what I was getting at was again the right shoulder, like wheel and deal. Well, why is wheel and deal nowadays? Why is it a? And I'm asking the question to one of you knows the reason. Why is wheel and deal a right shoulder pass, or is it something with a wheel and a deal? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you 
if you go back far enough, there was deal and wheel, and wheel don't deal, and deal don't wheel. Uh, that's and there's also it. shuffle and wheel, and yeah. shuffle the deck. And before my time, man. Are you on point for this, or? Yes, it's about ahead, the whole linear cycle thing, actually, Francois Lamoureux. Uh It's my sort of somewhere between understanding and gut feeling that linear cycle from inverted lines is uh, not really proper at plus, the way I see it. I think it's, it's I, I put it in the same group like linear cycle from two-faced lines or lines or something, and I think, as far as I'm concerned, I think that should be advanced and so on. I would have sympathy for that. Um, from waves only for the plus program, it says here. Yeah, that's explicitly in the definition. That I mean, that inverted line application that we looked at is definitely an, an extended application. As I said, it's very extended. I wouldn't use it below challenge. I'd use it as advanced, but I'm weird. Where would you, to follow on with something Francois said, where would you put uh, linear cycle out of two-phase lines? Because he mentioned that as a case as well. Advanced. It depends on, you know, questions like that. Now we're getting into, like, questions about caller judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're calling plus to a really strong floor and you're trying to figure out how can I entertain these folks if, if the nature of the floor is that they seem to be enjoying choreographic uh, puzzles and complexity, then I might try a linear cycle from, from two face lines with them. But definitely from a plus perspective, it is a very unusual situation. So you'd probably wind up having to workshop it, like just calling it cold is not oh. going to be successful. You've got to build up to it. But again, to go back to the to the idea that there's a sort of a jailhouse lawyer attitude that that ain't plus, you can't call it, right? Um, I don't think that's so. You can call it as long as you set it up so that the dancers are successful and that you don't do it in a way that contradicts any of the well-understood rules of the call. Wade, Wade has a question. I think that falls under the category. Let me show you guys something cute. You're going to love this. You know, you're do right. We need, do we need a square? Cause, no, no, no. What I'm saying, that's what you're going to say. I get my dancers. And oh. if you're right, if they're enjoying it, is let me show you guys something cute. You're going to love it. And when you walk out the door tonight, forget it. Yeah. You know, right. This is playtime. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. playtime, you can do almost anything. If you're going to be serious about it, then you better use a little judgment. Yeah. And even if you're not, you better use a little judgment. I mean, the reality <laughs> is that any dance, you can do anything you damn well please if the dancers are enjoying it. And you're you're not creating a, a future problem for them by by uh, getting them to think that something you've done is gospel and it contradicts other widespread practice. Uh, but do whatever makes the dancers happy. I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> Brett, no, Brett you're Gavin, coming up with good stuff, Brett. Brett Gavin, keep it up, in Washington. Can somebody answer the question why seesaw is no longer a left shoulder dose of dough? Because. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just, my only comment is it takes a lot longer to say left shoulder dose of dough than seesaw. E yes. Yeah. Well, this was part of the George Bernard Shaw School of Simplifying Square Dancing, you see. Left shoulder dose of dough is easier to learn than learning another word for left shoulder dose of dough part of the time and the other second half of a gypsy, the other half of the time, which is what Seesaw was. Um, you should get the sense from this that I don't completely believe the rationale. But that the idea was that it was a simplifying move. Can we say then just left, dosa do? Sure. sure. That's the theory. Uh, just a short comment on Seesaw, Francois Lamour again. I think as far as I'm concerned, we had Seesaw. You could, could, have, could have called like heads left square through, Seesaw, left swing through, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was the exception, unless walk around the corner or all around the left-hand lady, as it used to be called, comes first. Then the Seesaw is the second half of that figure eight uh, 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 move thing there. Yep. And uh, it, it became... To a, it came to a situation where the exception became the rule, and you could not call a seesaw and have for a left shoulder dose at all with a decent reaction. 
I think that's the way that that's why it was called uh, changed. This is called progress. I think Remember, it's a we're, we're trying to capture a folk art. <laughs> right. They never should have changed that. It was a, a walk around your left hand lady, and, and then a seesaw was a left walk around period. And then somebody said, "Oh, look, let's do a left-handed do side do." Instead of calling it that, they called it a seesaw. That's well, what I think. When did that happen? God only knows. I just got here. Uh, walk around your left hand lady. Seesaw your tall. Seesaw was a left-handed walk around. And uh, they got rid of somehow, and they put this this damn windshield wiper thing in there, and that's and that's never written down any place. But all the dancers seem to want to do it, so I never call a seesaw any time. As of the early seventies in New England, seesaw was a left dosada exclusively. I I'm telling you what the reality was in New England in the early seventies. <laughs> said that see right. in your reality it's not written so but you can still do it when i say I, well who said that well i've re- i've read it and the way i was it was written mm-hmm. it was a left-handed walk around yep. and then somebody later on said okay it's a do side do and i said uh-uh it's a left-handed do side do say left-handed do side left do side do don't say seesaw and I, i'm just wondering when that what time period that was that you were that that you you saw that change happen well, see, there are benefits of being old. Yes. But this is one of them. As I learned it in, in 59 or 60, whatever it was, it was walk around your corner, seesaw your partner, go back to your corner. Uh-huh. And it wasn't a figure eight originally. Where it came into a figure eight, I got no idea. But originally, as I understand it, you know, now I've, I've been wrong a whole lot more than I've been right. But as I understood it, it was walk around your corner, which was coming back to your partner, seesaw your partner, and go back to your corner. I mean, a lot of times we do a dozy do and go back to your corner, you know, and I'm not saying it's smooth, but that's what we do. Mm-hmm. But as I understood, when I first learned seesaw was a dozy do, then it evolved, like Francois said, the way it became the rule, and we forgot about the, the exception became the rule as well. So, yeah, so what we've clearly got here is a history where there were a couple of different ways of looking at it yeah. and in different parts of the country. Like, actually, what was happening there, if you, if you think about it, is what was being called was actually not very good body flow, and the dancers were smoothing it out. So instead Probably. of doing a real do do they were not doing that last turn because they were going to wind up facing the person they were going to be working with next. So the dancers smoothed it out, and over time, as our folk art evolved, the call itself got redefined to to not involve that final turn. So it wasn't a do do anymore. It was more like the figure eight thing that we think of today. Um, so that's an example of the definitions, you know, being adjusted to what the practice was as opposed to what the original idea might have been. You're right, because if you'll notice, if you go to, you square through four to your corner, if you do sit do and go back to your partner and right and left grand, they will do a walk around. You don't have to tell them. They'll do it. Yeah. Uh. Just your body just goes that way unless it hurts, you know. Yeah, if they, if they know what's coming, if you stack the call so that they know what's coming after that dose do, they won't make, you know, the turn. They they won't complete the dose do and then do you turn back. So we've been having a long discussion here about reality and what is and is not true about a particular call in this case seesaw. And it's been two different discussions, I think, and I just want to make sure to separate the two. There's the where we are now, where I think we can look at the paper and agree on what it is, and there's the how we got here. Um, And I suspect that a bunch of us lived through the how we got here from various aspects. I I, I lived through it from the it was a left shoulder dosado always as far as I got taught sounds like you lived through it from it was the second half of a gypsy and then suddenly got turned into left dosado when somebody came to town and said no no it's a left dosado can't you tell is it am i am i reading you about right and yeah it's it's just like recycle reach across and pull it around when it first came out yeah. it's, oh no wait a minute it's a no hands movement well that's fine you know yeah so th- this is this is one of the things, the definitions, were supposed to help us with. Because you've got these regional 
or little disconnected pockets of people where somebody changes it because it feels better. And suddenly in Kansas City, not just to pick an area, not because I believe it's true here, it changes to be that way because the local dance leader, man, this feels better, let's do it this way, and everybody goes along with him. And suddenly somebody comes in from New England trying to dance it and gets whanged because it, he's doing it the other way. We have all, we zero in on standard. Uh, Ken Britton, Montgomery, Alabama. This is the, I, mean, I started dancing in Montgomery in 84. Mm -hmm. um, got interested in calling about, about five or six years ago. Uh, this is the first I've ever heard that a seesaw was a left-handed dose side dog. I've never heard that before. I've never seen it done before. And, it, and when, I, when I started doing calling, and one of the premises is, I think, of, of the idea of this session is, you know, when, is the idea of where you start and where you finish. And, and to me as a caller, the idea of a left-handed doe side doe is going to end up facing your partner. The idea, in the idea of a, of a seesaw, you're going to face your corner. Yep. And so it's real important to me that, that, that a definition necessarily must end a certain way. Yep. And, and I think what you're seeing here is the result of evolution over time. As the and, and we do have definitions that actually say, as part of the definition, the ending position depends on the next call. Yeah. For instance, the definition of arm turns says that. Uh, Ned Newberg, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I bought a set in order colors manual years ago mm -hmm. that had, along with, Seesaw had it as a left shoulder do side out in the actual manual. So mm -hmm. that's what, you know, I used for a long time, and I don't know whether it's ever been corrected. It sets an order manual. Uh, you'd have to talk to uh, Alamina, I think. Seesaw. Each dancer walks forward and around the partner, keeping left shoulders adjacent, then steps forward to face the corner, is the current definition of seesaw. So it's the figure eight. Each dancer walks forward and around the partner, keeping left shoulders adjacent, then steps forward to face the corner. Note, this call is to be used only in conjunction with walk around the corner. That's the current definition. And that's... Yeah, sure. I'm sure not everybody's happy with it. That's which definitions are a compromise. Makes it pretty limiting when you think about it. <laughs> and intentionally so, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Process of creating a definition from disparate views is like making sausage or pickles or anything else. You yeah. don't want to be in the room when it's happening because it's ugly and very smelly. Yeah. <laughs> and you hope that something very tasty comes out the far side. Yeah. Last year we uh, voted to put something on the on the C1 list, which people had been doing, and that was why we, we felt that it should be on a list somewhere, but it actually, at that point, was not on a list. And uh, so we thought, well, this should be easy. People are already doing it. Yeah. And since it wasn't on a list... There was no written definition for it. Yeah. Well, a year and a bit later, <laughs> we're still fussing with this definition. What is um, it? Interlock triangles. Uh, so, we're, you know, when you actually start to, to write things down that people are doing as part of our folk art, it becomes vastly more complicated when you try and create the written version of that thing that's being done to really convey the meaning of uh, and the intent of, of what the action is supposed to be and at the same time limit the usage to that which we consider, quote, um, what, fashionable or I don't like to use tasteful. the word proper, tasteful. That's the good word. Uh, because there are things that you, we, we can do that follow the written definition, which yeah. we consider to be, right, you know, in yeah, bad gross. taste. Um and that even though it follows the written definition, we'd never want to do that, uh, or at least not if you want to be booked back. You don't want to, you wouldn't do that. Not if you want to leave town other than. With and there's other brothers. things that we do that are you know not not voiced in the definitions in any way that people just do because they they know how to do it. So 
we're, we're reaching the end of our time here, so maybe by way of summary, um, I, I know the tack that I've been on with this, and, uh, and uh, I'm not sure to what extent John agrees with me, is that the definitions as, as we use them are this, this attempt to, to, to have kind of a catchment area for whatever the current consensus is for the practice of our, of our calls. Um, and that in that role, they're both attempting to move with the new consensus as it evolves and at the same time attempting to put kind of a break on that evolution so that it doesn't run wild and turn into a cancer that, that threatens our activity. So there are mechanisms there that allow people to, to comment on or make suggestions about um, any, any definition or the lists, for that matter. Uh, we're, we're in a triennial, triennial review year now, so that's a year when you can say, I'd like to see this added or dropped off a list. Um, it's also a good time to revisit the definitions of calls that we, we already do. So the mechanisms are there in place. If you, if you have input, is probably the best way to put it, if you have input about current definitions or the content of current lists, um, to either just send something directly to Caller Lab and the home office will farm it out to the appropriate place. You can just send a note to CallerLab at AOL.com uh, or send something to Clark. Certainly anything to do with definitions, if you send it to Clark, it'll get to the right place. Um, and uh, we, we depend on that mechanism to make things uh, evolve as they need to. John, your summary remarks? It's all a big mess. And it will stay a big mess. Absolutely. Because we just get one mess cleaned up, you know, and, and maybe solidified so that we think we understand what's going on, and then another one will crop up because have things a, evolve. We have a comment we have from a question? Me. Well, no, basically I was just going to, to, to actually back up what you said. In the late 70s, we went through a war, several wars, yep. trying to go through these definitions. And those who weren't there, for example, and it was something that John had said, Take cross-trail through, which used to be a, a mainstream basic. It was done three ways across the country. And to change it, you'd think someone was trying to take their firstborn. Yep. I mean, you know, I mean, my father and I, we didn't speak for six months over cross-trail through. <laughs> you know, and he taught me to call. My dad had two ways doing things, perfect and wrong. And when we end up going <laughs> away from the way he wanted to do it, he was not a happy camper. But you do what is best for the activity, what's the most effective. Yep. And... Yeah, hopefully we have a, a democracy. That don't, well, I don't care which way you vote. I'm going to do it my way. And unfortunately, that happens on occasion, and we need to stop it. And we need to, to try at least have the same kind of way. And we are all human, and no matter how often we've revised these definitions and made them better each time, two years later, somebody comes along with a, but you forgot this. You must not have been thinking about it carefully. <laughs> yeah. And you'd be surprised how often that pops up when we thought about it very carefully. And you just can't get everything. So you got suggestions for improvement? Get them into the hopper for Pete's sake. Join the committee. The definitions committee is not a closed committee. All you got to do is agree to review things and give comments. And it, it's mostly done by email. And to contact any of the program chairs, the Mainstream Plus Advanced Challenge program chairs, their email addresses are all on the Caller Lab website. If you go to the committee section, there is an email address. Sometimes it says, like, advanced at callerlab.org, but that is forwarded automatically to the chair of the advanced committee. So there is an easy way to get your input out to exactly who you want to get it to. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, if you sit down and want to write a movement, uh, how do you get that approved? For a particular movement. Approved. Yeah. I'm do, I'm, for example, uh, mm -hmm. explode the diamond, explode to a diamond. How do you get that approved by the committee, or do, can you do that? Um, is it on a program somewhere? And I think the answer is no. I, th I think what you're asking is if you invent a new call, yeah. how, how could you get it added to one of the program's lists? Right. And th I guess the real answer is that we, we don't have a defined mechanism you know, you follow these 25 steps and it's going to appear on the on the list. I mean, the fact is, if you wrote a call, right. um, you'd share it with your friends and see if they'd be willing to, you know, use it in their programs. And it starts to sort of spread in a viral kind of a way. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen is 
a call that somebody's starting to use as a new call gets picked up by other people who start to, to use it in other places. And after a while, the dancers start to become familiar with that there's this thing going around, and you'll see it in workshops and that kind of thing. And then the next thing you know, there's kind of a consensus developing that, gee, this is kind of a neat call. You know, maybe we should do something with that. And somebody would then make a proposal to one of the program uh, committees, depending on what program you thought it was appropriate for, that – during a triennial review, or actually any time, but triennial yeah. review is certainly the ideal time, that why don't we add this call to the list? Um, and then that would be re- reviewed by the committee. And again, the committee is composed of you. Like, these committees are not people that are sitting up in an ivory tower somewhere, you know, making these decisions in, in isolation. The committees are made up of callers who practice at that level, at the, whatever the, the program level is. So the committees are you. If you don't like what the committee's doing, get involved, and you can help change it. We used to have experimentals, but we don't have them anymore. Not as a not as a defined program, no. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. And uh, we used to have quarterly selections, and yeah. that program has sort of gone by the, 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 the by. Dancers' tastes have changed over the years. There was a time when, when dancers felt that if, if they went to a festival or a weekend and didn't learn five or six new calls, that, you know, it was a, a dud. Um, and I think that peaked back in the late 80s, early 90s, when it actually went too far in that direction, and people were thinking, geez, you know, every time I go, i got to learn all these new things I'm never going to see again, um, and it's, it's just tiring. I don't want to keep learning calls that I never hear again. Well, I could have sworn I, that was late 70s, early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was my experience. But, but anyway, now we, I think we've gone too far in the other direction. We have almost no... Uh, mechanism for introducing new material into the programs and lists. We don't have quarterly selections. We don't have experimentals well, that that's are why I formally asked the documented. Question. So now I'm going to answer a slightly different question from what you asked, but I think it's relevant. How, if you've got an idea, do you best communicate it to other people? And the answer is think about the questions that I'm going to ask. Where does it start? What do the dancers do? And be fairly specific. If you mean girls, say girls. If you mean right-hand dancer, say right-hand dancer. Depending on what you mean, I mean it's your, your call. Where, where, where should I expect it to end? I'm going to wonder whether I can roll after it. I'm going to wonder whether I can sweep a quarter after it. I'm going to wonder what free hands I have before it and after it. If you can convey that, it's way more likely that I'm going to read that, go, yeah, I see how I can fit that in and start using it, than if I have to try to tweeze it apart and figure out what the heck you meant. In, in fact, a, a good way to think about that is um, in the caller coaching materials, there's uh, uh, a sheet for uh, the call diagramming sheet. a call, the, uh, the call analysis sheet. So if you can take your new call and run it through that call analysis sheet, it asks all those kinds of questions about it. So it's sort of a way of capturing the attributes of the call, and it'll force you to really think about the call. You know, geez, what would, what would happen if they put a roll on the end of it? And it lets you think about all these other contingencies, and it would certainly help you to make the call more robust. Wade has a comment. I was just going to say I'm so glad you brought that up because I've already submitted it to the Board of Governors, and I've got it written. I'm going to do it again. We have gone too far the other way, and we are boring. All right, I'm sorry. We just are, and I agree. It got we went over the hill back in I agree with John late seven, early mid '80s, whatever. But we need new products. We, you know, the round dancers, God bless them, some idiot cuts a country western song and they got a new product with a new dance. We had not had new products in 30 years. And we Evolve need a new or product. die. Huh? Evolve, Evolve or, die. or die. Thank you, sir. That sounds like a new call. <laughs> <laughs> you can write it. I don't want anything to do with it. We're now five minutes over time. So I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for coming and for your participation in the meeting. Thank you very much.